conversation moderated by her. My name is Yulia Chokai, and I study in the San Francisco Secondary School. And I'm actually going to um, raise questions that are coming from my entire class. We actually had a discussion yesterday between 10 and 4 in the afternoon what our rights are. And yesterday I realized that a lot of people, lots of children don't even realize that they have rights and that there is actually a legislative framework for it. So one of my first questions is what I also, that we kept raising today, what sort of rights we have and how can we exercise these rights in order to make sure that we do not violate the rights of others but we still can be represented. I don't know if you can understand my question. Well, I'm not going to talk about the legal aspects of it, but I think the most important right of a child is to grow up in a loving environment. And what we heard in the previous discussion, obviously, these are crisis uh, situations that can be somehow managed in an efficient way. But I think the most important right is that you can expect an adult society to create an attitude, a mentality, which, in which your lives is a value and where you are approached in a loving way. and. And and you're and you're not considered as a little adult, but um, you are loved and cared for, and it, it applies for all sorts of areas: um, legislation, education, healthcare. So all the values that you might not even be able to articulate, because obviously you are children, especially for example a three-year-old cannot share their opinion on their best interest. But obviously, the ladies who are representing children rights, of course, have a completely different approach. But in my case, I, I would like to mention the general societal expectation. Well, actually, uh, I would like to answer this question a different way. What it reminds me of is how much we are still in an initial phase if an even a teenager has this question that they are not aware what their rights are and how they can exercise this right. So we still have a long way to go to make sure that even in schools it's a, a given thing that, that uh, parents um, also educate children about their rights. Uh, that's, of course, very important. But we mustn't forget that life starts within a family. And even there, it's not quite clear so that children have rights. Not every parent knows that. So we have a lot to do in this field. And there are a lot of organizations trying to work on trying to make this kind of information accessible in a child-friendly way uh, to children. And also, when it comes to applicability, well, everywhere. So whatever we discuss today, obviously, the court is, luckily enough, the situation where not a lot of children get to. But also, in, in schools, in hospitals, you do have rights. And you should be aware of your rights. And those who uh, have um, received services, it is important um, to be aware of it. Well, um, I wanted to share the same thing with you. But first of all, I would like to congratulate you for being a moderator at this panel discussion. I am representing UNICEF Hungary. And actually, quite recently, we organized a conference where the reporters were children. And I know it's a really responsible task. And you do need to prepare quite a bit to be able to perform this job. So first of all, I wanted to congratulate you for this. Secondly, it kind of reminded me of something. Uh, lots of um, child protection experts 
talk in a very sophisticated way about uh, child about um, well uh, children rights and then it makes me realize how much we still have to do and actually we have a program called alarm uh, or what and what it means is that we actually do activities in schools when we can talk about their Right. Actually, I'm a trained psychologist, and my approach to this issue is always to to have the needs of the child as a starting point. So often when we are talking about children's rights, it seems so abstract. And then often we think, oh, I have no idea what their rights are, because it just sounds so complicated, such a complex legal issue. Uh, but when it comes to child protection professionals or teachers or adults in general, and we start talking about children's rights, my starting point is always we need to think about it, what children need. And then when we start thinking about it, and obviously they say these self-evident things, that they need a loving family, food, shelter, water, education. And of course, we list all of them on a piece of paper, and then we reveal the truth that every single need is actually a right. Um, usually, that uh, comes down very well with adults, but also with children, of course. Thank you. At the panel discussion in the morning, um, we discussed the issue whether or not. So, what happens when I'm attending a class and I exercise my right uh, to education, but someone wants to express his opinion, and that's uh, in uh, this right is in collusion with my right. So, so where does it start? Where, where does my right end and his right start? Because obviously, I need to exercise my right, but without violating someone else's right. I think that applies to all human rights, that even though these are universal rights, but only as long as we do not violate the rights of others. And of course, in all human relationships, well, if you take a closer look, there are no equal relationships. Well, in this particular situation, what you've just described, that you want to learn or study and then someone is just uh, too noisy. It is the responsible uh, responsibility of the teacher to resolve this situation. So there is a hierarchical situation um, because it also involves uh, a relationship between a teacher and a pupil. And unless it is bordering, let's say, bullying in that particular case, then of course that's a completely different context. Um, so there might be some procedures in place within an institution when it is really this disturbing of the class is bullying. But all in all, so this particular conflict needs to be resolved by a teacher. I think I'll take a different approach. So when we are talking about right and especially the right to education and and of course if there is a collision of rights of equal parties then often there are feelings or needs behind it and actually in the previous discussion we also heard that what we can see now and what is very very useful is um, this the um, the, so basically um, a restorative uh, technique and that really helps to resolve conflicts in schools. So lots of experts and professionals use this technique. So when you have the feeling that your rights are in collusion, in collusion with others um, in school, uh, that is something that you need to resolve with the involvement of some others sometimes. So communication is the key here. I think my colleagues basically summed up the major point here. This is one of the major problems uh, of humanity, really. Uh, so we all live in this. So how can we live together in such a way that we obviously, we all have rights and we want to exercise our rights, but at the same time, we mustn't disturb each other. And the communities play a crucial role in this. So what a community uh, or a group of people think about um, their cohabitation and, and uh, well, 
obviously. The fact is that these kids should not really play the jungle fighters um, among each other, so that this kind of conflicts so, uh, need to be resolved with the help of an adult. Well, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I think these questions also um, are coming from the fact that we have a crisis of values when certain moral values are not self-evident and often we interpret in important issues, also in the context of children's rights, differently. And of course, this might also be infiltrated into a school community. And often we don't talk to each other you might actually believe that people uh, representing differing opinions do not talk to each other. And uh, well, that's never a good sign. But if you are able to handle your conflicts without violence, that's good. Yesterday, there was another issue we discussed. Some people take studying very seriously, some not so much. And we talked about it that my education is my right, but also obligation at the same time, because I'm obliged to go to school um, at, until the age of 16. But how can these two things coexist? So it's my right, but am I obligation at the same time? So is it a right or an obligation? So the right to education is at the same time an obligation as well. So the right to learning to education means that that every child needs to be offered the opportunity to go to school and to attend quality education. But it does not mean that it's not an obligation at the same time. So that's a basic principle, so to say, that government states have to do their best to make sure that quality education is provided to children. So there are rights that are obligations at the same time. For example, also um, the care provided by parents. It's also, obviously, the uh, parents can choose the way and the form of uh, how they want to raise their children, but it's an obligation as well. I think it's no point really dwelling on these concepts and notions for too long because it's a bit too abstract. But about obligations and rights often coincide. So the way we should see it, that this is an opportunity that the government is obliged to provide, but whether or not, so what do you do with this right, how you exercise it, who takes, for example, studying seriously and who doesn't, that's, um, that comes to the individuals. And also, it's a choice. So also, the legislator needs to make a decision uh, concerning the obligatory school age. And we need to realize that, um, that uh, for example, there are lots of uh, early dropouts. And of course, that entails a lot of risks um, concerning homelessness, unemployment, and obviously, well, the way you as a child think about it is why is it an obligation for me? You don't really see it as an opportunity as a child, but that solves problems or potential problems that um, as, a, as a society we experience. So people in disadvantaged situation experience this problem. So, so for example, if there is a minimum obligatory age um, that is regulated by the state. Yeah, in certain situations, we can see that children um, are basically left out from education. Actually, last year, you all remember that children could not go to school. They had to do online education. And that, of course, based on various studies, clearly uh, shows that about 25% of children did not actually not participate in education, in digital education, and they dropped out. And a, a fundamental right uh, was therefore violated, namely their access to education. And of course, education also uh, has the objective to uh, to. Mm. 
um, combat social inequalities and to promote social inclusion. So there are certain needs um, that is uh, then um, satisfied. And now a bit a different topic. Today we've heard a lot about abuse. Um, psychologists or any kind of teacher in school, we talked about what they can do. But what can children do if they sue, say that somebody is being abused or they themselves are being abused? What can they do? Or what can a perpetrator do so that they recognize that they actually what they are doing is abuse? So in order for a perpetrator to recognize that he himself is a perpetrator, that's, that's a good question. So uh, uh, I'm not sure that the pers- the chi- this child would uh, define himself this way. But uh, definitely, if there is a school in a school community, am I talking about abuse in school or in the family? No, first and foremost in school. Well, then. It's the competence of the head teacher, the the the, the headmaster. Um, so in, in in child, there is a responsible for child protection. So uh, in such cases, uh, they should be contacted, and uh, the the sooner, the better because the solution has to be found to such a problem as soon as possible. Um, I don't want to say that this is my favorite topic because that would sound a bit bizarre. So if I would say abuse is my favorite topic, but definitely it is a central topic that UNICEF deals with also because the um, uh, Children's Rights uh, Committee um, uh, actually uh, defined and declared that um, they want to deal with this topic later on and uh, encourage uh, um, governments, also Hungarian government, to have a strategy for this, so child abuse, be it in the family or in the school. So UNICEF deals with this issue. Not so long ago, um, research was published that we did together with Median Institute, which investigated abuse by peers. And uh, the data were really shocking. Uh, about 66% of children say, that they uh, uh, they experience regular abuse in school, and this included uh, bullying, mobbing, physical, uh, psychological abuse. Uh, it's really worth uh, uh, consulting the website of UNICEF. In 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 in, uh, in 50 percent of cases, uh, parents are being contacted for help, uh, or. Um, mainly the head teacher is uh, being asked for help and in in half in 50 percent of cases uh, such issues are more or less solved uh, but there are huge differences depending on the types of schools in um, it what is important that 25 percent of children say and it's really shocking that they have no one to turn to so they are the ones who are in the biggest danger who uh, with whom the highest risk lie so uh, the the young 30 percent of young people children said that uh, it already happened that they did not want they didn't go to school because they were afraid of uh, being abused by their uh, classmates it is definitely true that um, it is part of normal socialization socialization in the school that there are normal conflicts this is uh, an engine of development so there uh, to have conflicts because through conflicts we learn the norms of a community that's one thing that's okay but there is a huge difference between so to say normal conflicts or normal competition and abuse one thing is sure that we should encourage uh, uh, children uh, to to have uh, an adult uh, whom they can share their uh, problems uh, uh, so n- nobody should be left alone not even adults can solve such uh, situations on their own so even they should turn to 
person who they can confide in, and this is the same case uh, for children. I would reflect on another aspect of this matter. Those institutions where uh, the children are, so child protection institutions, it would be great, just as it has been mentioned in one of the presentations, if it wouldn't be something shameful that uh, abuse uh, takes place in this institution. So in, in the online world, the digital world, the, the, there are so, such cases ever more frequently. And it's an imp the first important thing is to face it, that this exists. And then the next step is, is to work on preventing such abuses, to react on such abuses. And uh, just to add to what Viola said, it is necessary to have an adult who the child can turn to, can confide in. Just one more thought to this. Uh, there is a huge difference as opposed to our childhood. That, that it is a huge dilemma of today's society. Uh, so that uh, uh, from the age of 13, everybody can be present in social media. And, and mostly without the consent of, of the, the, the parents. Uh, so, uh, and, and it was also an existing problem that false data are being given in, uh, on social media ads, but this 13 years of age is definitely not the right one. Uh, but this is already over the borders of our competence. But real solutions, if we are talking about the rights of children, then, for example, uh, this, this online space, some kind of regulation there would really be necessary. And just as a closing question, do you think some kind of prevention is possible so to have less uh, cases of abuse, be it in online space or in school. Well, first and foremost, uh, I would stress uh, the role of the family, a good relationship to parents. And uh, uh, so, and, and, and have a kind of knowledge about one's rights, one's body, uh, according to age groups, but to have to have a really good relationship between parents and children to have uh, so that the children uh, can really turn to them if they have any kinds of problems. Uh, and if this is not possible uh, to have at least one adult, be it a doctor or a teacher who is a person of confidence so that if abuse is really taking place, then there is an adult who can be contacted and who can react to this. Uh, this is really important to recognize the first signs of abuse. If there is a healthy self-esteem uh, in someone, then this is already a good prevention. So this is rooting in the family values. So if there is a, a good a confidential safe space and if uh, one really thinks that it's no problem to ask for help help and uh, then, then and, and yes that uh, even in from when it come when it comes to difficult situation there is always a place i can turn to friendship should also be highlighted uh, it's an offline domain uh, where really you can um, meet in person and discuss uh, problems. I just would like to add how um, violence, uh, aggression in school could be decreased. So peer aggression and uh, peer abuse, 
in society also depends, so the level of this depends on the general, of, uh, uh, general level of violence in that given society. So the social context has to be seen too. So if there's a lot of violence going on in the whole of the society or between social groups or uh, uh, between politicians or, or in families, uh, so uh, all this determine how the children behave. So um, violence in school is just one location where violence takes place. Uh, Again, we come back to the social norms. So this is only one domain of this. So in, lo in the long run, um, the violence in school will decrease if the whole society or in the whole world, uh, violence uh, will decrease. Of course, this uh, does not really help you right now. <laughs> so. Um, uh, so it's again how to reach world peace. Uh, oh yes, that would have been maybe my second question. But no, I just wanted to tell you this, that we should not think that uh, uh, violence in school is something existing in itself. No, this is always the consequence of what children see at home uh, or from their teachers on the bus or hear from the politicians and so on. So. And, and concrete on the level of, of tools, teachers need uh, really uh, to have a, a good toolkit um, uh, that help them intervening in such conflicts, in such situations. So uh, children say mainly that uh, about 40% uh, of the cases teachers know about bullying going on in, in classes and, and from these 10% really intervene and mainly then punishment follows but not this kind of restorative process or so not this kind of uh, um, discussion on a class level. So it's also the feedback from the teachers that they would like to have an adequate toolkit uh, and, and, and again, uh, uh, sexual abuse and so on, that's again something where they are feeling lost, where they don't know how to handle such situations, even though there were some uh, initiatives that they should be built into teacher training. Uh, but, but then again, this is not a real answer to your question. So actually, uh, it's just my idea to please invite us. Uh, uh, let's have this alarm lesson. That is our project. Uh, it is very popular. And on the other hand, you and your peers, uh, it is good that you're thinking about this, that, that abuse is a bad thing, that we should deal with this. It should be topic on a class level. Uh, it should be uh, really uh, uh, cool to help, um, and 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 also the roles of victims and perpetrators. They are very often are mixed up and uh, are so. It should be cool if you want to help and 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 please be active. Um, with, with with help and with friendship, uh, support one another. I'm just. One more personal experience. Um, my my children attend uh, the PRA school in Vats, and when there are some delicate issues, for example, a child with Asperger's syndrome, um, the whole class has to learn how to deal with this child, and then they discuss it together with parents, and. So these are good solutions, for example. Just two more things. Uh, we've already mentioned resilience, how important this is. But still, uh, we have not really researched uh, how this can be developed from the inside, from the outside. So uh, if uh, there are people who react to uh, even small traumas very badly, and there are others who are very resilient even when it comes to big traumas. So how can you become resilient? How can you deal uh, with a case of abuse? And then self-esteem is another important issue. And also what came to my mind, to team parenting. So if, if, if can the parent, the doctor, the teacher, 
can they really cooperate, collaborate in your interest and the child interest of the three parents, so to say, uh, it, it, such children are, can be happy who have three or four parents, so to say, that can be a protective factor. So it's again a question that this whole bunch of adults, can they really work together and communicate with one another in your, in the child's interests, uh, because that would be really good. I think this was an excellent thought, and thank you very much for answering all my questions. I hope you enjoyed this roundtable discussion. Yes, very much. Thank you.